Oh, hello. Look at you tuning into this podcast again. I hope you had a great holiday and welcome to the year 2022. My name is Terry and this is the fourth year in a row that I've been running this podcast now. Actually, I just ran the stats and last year this podcast got 65,523 listens which is insane to me. I just started this podcast with the intention of making a few connections in the industry and learning some hot tips on how to further my career. And I'm just both surprised and so proud of how much it's grown since then. I hope you get so much value out of these episodes and it really helps you in your animation journey as well. So thank you for tuning in and I am so glad you are here. This chat is with a super friend of mine. His name is Bill Allenson, and he is also an amazing stop motion animator. In our chat, he's gonna share how he survived as an independent animator in Toronto, what he's learned about self-promotion to get new gigs, and his plans to create an original web series, build an audience for it, and then sell it. But first, this episode is sponsored by Hue, makers of colorful, affordable USB cameras and animation software for creative teaching, work, and play. Available from HueHD.com and Amazon, the new HueHD Pro camera features 1080p image and video resolution, a built-in microphone, and LED lights. Their funky, flexible plug-and-play cameras are easy to use, and they are compatible with any apps that recognize USB cameras, including Discord, DragonFrame, OBS, Twitch, Google Meet, Zoom, and many more. Visit HueHD.com for more information and follow at Hue Cameras on Instagram or Twitter for news, freebies, and giveaways. And make sure you check out those links in the description of this chat. And now, without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, Bill. Hi, uh, what did you have for lunch today? I don't know. What's up? How are you? <laughs> what did I have for lunch? Did I have lunch today? I had some, I had some uh, oatmeal this morning, some nice oatmeal. And then you haven't eaten anything. It's like seven o'clock PM. I had some, I had some, well, I got some spicy Doritos here, but I, then I realized that being on a podcast and eating Doritos is probably the worst thing I could do. So am I revealing like your poor eating habits? You had oatmeal for <laughs> breakfast and then spicy Doritos before you go to bed. And that's it. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good. Today was a different day, but uh, you were just I, nervous about coming on this podcast. I understand. I, you, you frightened me. Uh, I'm going to, I'm kidding. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a very balanced uh, stir fry meal after this podcast. Excellent. I'm, uh, I'm excited for the stir fry that you're going to have. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you all. Well, how are you? Thank you for coming on the podcast. I, I feel like I'm, I, uh, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while and I was also like, we work together. So like, I'm excited and I feel like I already know everything, but like, I want you to rehash everything for people who don't know. So yeah. What do you consider yourself like as a for a career? Like, what do you what do you call yourself? What do you consider yourself? I've gone through many phases. You know, I'm I'm an animator. Um, I've 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 latched on to animation now. It's been a while. I would consider myself more. It's funny. I'm an experimental animator, but I have uh, I have a draw to the narrative always. I love writing. I love writing stories. Uh, I love creating characters, but I love executing it in in all the strange, wild ways I can imagine. You know, so why? So have... like you, you know, you studied film. You just said you love writing. Why yeah. does animation fulfill this career or this? You know, why is animation fulfillment for you specifically? You know, who who knows why something feels comfortable? Why why we connect to something? Animation you know, I, I grew up with as a, as a child born in the eighties, um, you know, uh, Will Vinton was everywhere. California raisins. I still have all my little California raisins characters from when I was little stop motion and claymation was always just, it was kind of what was on TV. Um, ABC Saturday morning cartoons was like, was it, you know, I learned how to program my VCR by myself when I was, I think six, so I could get up early and tape all my, um, my animated programs. And they had little bumpers in between all the shows. I was like, after these messages, we'll be right back. And it would be little claymation character. Do you remember those? Yeah, of course. And even that yeah, tune, yeah. like I was singing it along in my mind with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know, um, that just stuck and it just made sense. And filmmaking always made sense and everything. The, all those things made sense. And um, there was never a... Um, so much a plan B as well. If I don't make it in the arts, then, you know, back to the, back to the farm I go, which. So you, so. <laughs> no shame in so, that. So you grew up on a farm. Yeah, no, I did not grow up on a farm, literally. <laughs> but 
but okay so but like from a young age you're like i just want to do this cool funky thing and that's what i'm gonna do yeah i always wanted to it wasn't even a decision i just started doing it i just always made little animations when i was little um you know i was watching uh movies that were wildly inappropriate for uh, a young child um since i was since i was a wee tot my uh you know my this isn't this isn't a violin but my folks got you know divorced when i was really young and um you know who knows what's born out of that for me it gave me an opportunity usually to say you know mom said i could see this movie and then <laughs> mom said i could see this x-rated movie <laughs> <laughs> right and then and then bachelor dad's just like all right cover your eyes son and i'm and i'm doing one of these being like yeah 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 yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> so hilarious. i don't i don't know uh i i i um it's hard to intellectualize i just kind of yeah. with the flow kind of maybe thing. after this podcast you can go on like a little retreat and like you know find find yourself and the reasons why i'm just kidding yeah. so but okay so like at some point you had to say i want to live on my own i need income um and animation is my thing i start need to i need to start making money like tell me about that turning point for you and how because a, a big point that I think is really interesting is you called yourself an experimental animator. And I've never chatted in all of my chats. I've never chatted with somebody who considers himself an experimental animator. You know, you're, you're a stop motion animator, you're a 2d animator, you're a storyboard artist, but like, I think it's super interesting that you said that. So relate that to me to when you first uh, started getting client work enough to support yourself as an adult, I guess. Yeah. I mean um, it's, it's always still, give and take, you know, there are still times I've, I've never been afraid to take out the garbage if I have to, you know, I've, I've worked as a server many years. I've worked every rando job under the sun. Um, I worked in television for a long time, it has nothing to do with animation. That was kind of more as I was really discovering that I was kind of really into choosing animation. I worked in TV and um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, Sorry, what was the initial question? At what point did you decide to pursue animation in a full-time enough sense to make a living off of it? Oh, yeah. Well, or maybe the answer is actually that you take odd jobs in between, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate now that uh, the tectonic plates of life have shifted in a way that I'm getting good, solid work as an animator now. And it's amazing. Nice. And oh my God, I'm so thankful for it. Um, you know, uh, I just always decided that I was just going to keep doing it regardless. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of that kind of stuff, I, I wouldn't have one film to my name if I sat and waited for funding all the time, because oftentimes a lot of the projects that I was trying to execute um, didn't fall under, you know, the right category or or I just didn't know how to articulate a weird idea in the pitch, you know, yeah. Um you know, I just kind of was the driving force was that I'm just going to get the movie made and you got to do whatever you got to do to get that movie made sometimes. So you just said the tectonic plates have shifted recently. Um, is this like a state you've been trying to get you've been working towards where you can work full time in animation? Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. 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 I decided I think it's when I, I don't, it, you know, I think sometimes it can be as simple as you just have to really decide what exactly you want. And for me, I decided I had to really focus and I said, okay, well, what do you, what do you want? And I said to myself, I want to, I want to get paid to animate. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be my own work. You know, we're always working toward that, but, um, I just want to get paid to animate in general. That's a fun job. That's something I want to do all the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know with enough willpower with enough focus with enough uh you know vision boarding or whatever you got to do you know which i which i totally don't write off i totally believe in all that kind of stuff um uh things will just fall in your lap sometimes and um you know my story to where i am now is one of loving what i do being yeah. grateful for everything comes my way um being genuinely excited to meet other animators and just kind of like just just having blinders on to that end result, I think. So how long did it take to get to this state, do you think? Um, 
so 2021 you know probably like six seven years maybe wow so what kept you going you know like six seven years is a long time to say to actively say i'm working towards you know a state where i can get paid full time or to support myself through stop motion stop motion specifically or just any animation stop motion specifically so absolutely. stop motion specifically and like claymation because you're you like i feel like you've done you do any kind of stop motion like claymation like everything like i just love you know i saw that music video of yours recently and i, I was just like blown away by some of the cool special effects that you did that i've never seen before so okay what keeps you going for seven years like toiling in the fields trying to get to this state like are you just like it's gonna happen i'm chill or are you like you know like i'm somebody who's very intense i'd be like mad trying everything i can do every like week <laughs> i mean it's a combo of both things trying trying everything you can pitching everywhere trying contests um and then just sometimes like you know um uh, uh one film of mine new math that i did it it took a year to do it took uh you know another six months of pre-production it took another six months on the tail end of like getting it in front of people's eyes and stuff like that so you know we're we're looking at you know a little over two years or so at that point so that's that's where seven years goes i think yeah uh, right. i don't i just uh it's it you know maybe it's a quiet confidence maybe it's stupidity that I, it's just kind of like um i don't really worry so much about like oh god i'm i'm getting old like the white picket fence idea that went out that went out the window a long time ago. That's not. Oh no! no. I mean, it can still come into the window. It so, could come in the window for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's not in my vision board at the moment, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you had everything. I, I can you just describe your living situation because I think it's really cool. It's like a studio, stop motion living yeah. space. Like, and also I want to like know what's in your setup because everything you were doing prior to taking on Studio Buddies, I assume, was like. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, your own productions yep, and yep, your own my, equipment and everything? Largely my own stuff, my own equipment. You know, I would do uh, a corporate commercial every now and then. I would do like some TV bumpers or, um, um, yeah, some little rinky-dink things every once in a while. Um, I uh, Now I'm living in um, a warehouse um, and it's not, I think I'm the only person that lives here. It's weird. What do you mean? <laughs> There's yeah. like you look over and somebody else is on the couch and you're like, I, I mean, like in this, in this, in this unit, I live here. I, I, my, my girlfriend lives here with me, but, um, but in the building itself, um, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that lives here. I hear things late at night. Sometimes it might be haunted. I have no idea, but, but there's people that come and go. I, I'm surrounded by photography studios and random um, uh, job placement companies. And there's a flower studio down the hall and stuff like that. That was just a result of, you know, I was, um, I was living in a nice one bedroom apartment. And when I would make a film in the apartment, I, had a decision to make where it was like okay well you can either live in the apartment right now or you can make a film in the apartment and you know when I was making a film it meant that I was stepping over just all the debris of corks and shavings off of you know whatever material I was working with that day and it was a it was a war zone and it just got to the point where I was like okay I gotta I gotta figure something out and studio space was becoming increasingly um you know expensive in Toronto where I'm I'm in Etobicoke right now but in 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 the GTA uh and it was just one of those another one of those things my instinct was screaming at me that I had to figure something out and lo and behold on Kijiji they were advertising who was it advertised it was advertised as awesome awesome artist workspace and I was You're like, like cool. that's me I was I'm an awesome <laughs> artist let's do this and I came in and I looked at the unit and it was great and I saw that it's the only unit in here that has a kitchen and a, and a bathroom so I was like, oh, okay, cool. I think this was the lunchroom of whatever this building used to be. Cause this place was like, I, I think they let me move in too early too. Like it was, it was, uh, there were holes in the ceiling and stuff like that. Like it was, it was pretty gnarly when I first how moved. How big is this warehouse space you're living in now? Like, is it huge? Square footage is hard to say. It's not huge. It's, it's, it's spacious for a couple people. Um, but it's not humongous. A square footage escapes me all the time. So I have no real concept of. Sure. Like an average, probably like Toronto one bedroom is like, I don't know, they're kind of small, probably like six, 700 square feet. 
okay so then this is probably it's kind of like one big room with like a dog leg to it so it's probably like i don't know 14 oh wow okay that's I, I, twice as big nice I'm all, I'm all parking it. can i need to find a place like that for my own stop motion stuff because as you're saying i'm like yeah every time i get a project my bedroom turns into a studio and then it's like where do i do anything else where right, do i sleep exactly. no i know i know and at that time in my life too like i i could get away with that kind of stuff i could like just literally live in a war zone like the walls could be on fire and i'd be like oh well like yeah that's fine open whatever on fire. open on fire when i come home yeah so it's, okay so you told me you know you were getting some spots and commercials like how are you picking these things up because like you don't have a website right now like i know that you're on like some sites like uh, like you know listed as a director or filmmaker stuff are they coming from that do you have an agent are you just constantly bidding on whatever you see like i'm i'm bidding um I'm I'm pretty diligent on keeping my reel updated and on the only reason I don't have a website I've had a website that's come and gone a couple times and I just I I questioned if at the time it was worth the money only because even though websites are cheap right now maybe it's me just like upkeeping them um as new work would come in you know I would I would always just put it on my reel and then I would put it on Instagram or I'd put it on Vimeo or and I found that I was getting a lot of traction from that mainly gotcha. Instagram I've, a lot of people have viewed work on Instagram via um, just strategizing with maybe where you submit your work and getting lucky in a couple of the right spots and getting more views. And what do you mean? Where do you submit, where you submit your work like on okay. Instagram? So I did this movie um, new math a couple of years ago and pretty experimental, pretty weird. Yeah. And, it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was this, uh, there, it still is. It's a fairly popular page called love watts and i submitted to him just because he's a curator of crazy art from all over and and he wrote me back and he liked the work and said send me a one minute clip of your film and i'll and i'll put it online on my page hmm. and and it got a lot of views this i think the guy is like two million something followers and um and it was weird it was like it was my little tiny micro glimmer into what it's like to like you know not be a celebrity by any means but have a lot of eyeballs on your work all of a sudden and it was crazy i would every time i'd refresh there would be you know 1500 new views on the thing and it was really cool it was uh, it was exciting and a lot of people reached out to me from that and oh wow messages and stuff like that yeah and then um yeah and i got a lot of cool work from that um when i every time i update my linkedin i find that so okay so you specifically said hey i i just spent like 2 years on this project i'm going to like market the heck out of it and so part of that strategy was finding curators of content on social media and just yeah. reach and just sending them an email and saying like, Hey, would you like to repost my content? Absolutely that. Yeah. And, yeah. and like how many people ended up doing this just this one guy or like a whole bunch of people or like, I think like two or three out of probably like, like 60 people that I wrote 60 to. people. Oh my goodness. I thought you were going like to say like five, two or three out of five. No <laughs> swinging. For so the do you, do you just that. have a list of like people to go through every time you yeah, I mean, uh, on the next project I, I do, um, uh, it'll probably be a new list of people that I research over, you know, a month or so, yeah. just kind of seeing what's out there. And is, is Instagram the only place you do this? Or do you try to do this like with internet magazines or like Reddit or like Twitter or like just everything? Reddit for sure. Internet magazines. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then just, you know, reaching out to different studios all the time and uh yeah just trying you, to sorry I, i'm just curious what do you mean reaching out to studios like what what do you mean like hey oh, i'm an I... independent claymation stop motion guy if you ever have work in that realm contact me here's my demo yeah or hey do you want to buy this movie and show it somewhere <laughs> oh <laughs> really what yeah sometimes you know what do you I... mean buy this movie and show it somewhere so you make a movie yeah i sold a movie in japan okay tell me tell me about this this is yeah i, I don't remember the name of the place it's been so long since <laughs> you go to japan <laughs> no no i didn't go to japan it was uh kids network bought this other movie i did called dad fight um and uh and the 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 only thing i 
regret is not asking them if I could have the copy of the movie back after they, I think they went in and redubbed the voices of the characters and stuff like that. Oh no. I would have, I would have loved, no, no, that's not bad. I want to hear the Japanese. Yeah, it would probably be amazing. Voices. But, but like, I want to, okay. So hello, Japan. Hey, Japan. No. Um, like, how did, what do you mean? You just sold a movie. Like, yeah. tell me. I'm yeah. interested. I want to sell my movies. <laughs> yeah. My, my producer at the time, um, how did he get in touch with them? I, I would have to ask him. He, he cast a pretty wide net and I think he was looking at studios all over the world. And there was this one studio in Japan. Um, damn, I didn't know I was going to talk about this. Otherwise I would have. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Had the but studio on hand. Yeah. Yeah. How do you even get a producer in the first place? Like, I don't have a producer. Like I like making content. Is that like something I should look into myself? Like, well, so here's the thing. So I went to film school um, and maybe this is, maybe this is the, the bigger message of things is the old, it's not, it's not necessarily fake it till you make it. Well, and that is a, a brilliant concept that works. Um, well, you know, when I say producer, that's a great title, producer. It sounds very official, doesn't it? Yeah, this was a guy that I went to film school with. Okay, my friend. My, my buddy, <laughs> yeah. But he was my producer, so therefore you say, you know, my producer. You had, to, you had to, like, make some kind of deal with him to say, like, you know, if you sell this somewhere, you get X percent, blah, 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 blah. No, like, or is it just like, hey, buddy, like, here's a film I made have do what you want with it and if you can sell it like just yeah like me, nowadays me a beer. We, were, we were pretty we were pretty uh solid as it not we didn't have any falling out or anything you know we just life takes you in different directions yeah and and he was a champion of getting things in front of people's eyes and um in terms of money there wasn't a lot of money i think we sold it for like a couple grand or something which is great um i know i'd love i'd love it hey. <laughs> i'll take i'll take a couple grand for something i make for free <laughs> i know right yeah exactly um yeah so um yeah in terms of um you know just getting it in front of people's eyes uh, the thing with new math when i submitted it to love watts it was a new strategy where i um decided i didn't really want to submit it to too many film festivals mm because I found that I was spending a lot of money submitting to film festivals. Oh yeah. They all cost money. They cost money and they're, and they're great for what they are. But um, you know, I just thought that there would be greater value in having something seen. I only ever want the work to get seen. I don't really care. The laurels are, are great, obviously, but often we're not talking about getting into Sundance or, yeah. you know, You're getting into like small festival in XYZ town in whatever country. Yeah. And those are great festivals because oftentimes, and I've been in a lot of smaller festivals and they're great because the community usually comes out and, and um, sometimes it can be much more present um, than say, if you're in a larger festival where, you know, a lot of the time the audience is made up largely of friends and family of the filmmakers whose films are in them, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah uh, I just wanted, I just wanted to maximize instead of a room of 200 people, I wanted my film to be seen by as many people as possible. So when you were uh, before this year, because I want to talk about this year too, how often were you doing projects between other, uh, like other work? Like you were doing like one or two things a year or you'd have like a year break? Like, um, I, I worked um, as often as there was a, a, an idea that captured my, not my attention, but I felt was something I could really commit to. Um, I always have a, a list of ideas that I, that I like and want to do, and they just kind of get pushed down the, the ladder until I look at an idea and it's 10 years old. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something new. Um, uh, yeah, I usually find something that, you know, I find I, I to really keep me focused the idea has to usually the ideas that I love the most are the ones that just kind of like come to you in a lightning bolt instead of something that you've labored over too much. I find totally. that, yeah. you know, um, um, yeah. And then how often I'm doing them. Yeah. As often as I can, I, I had taken a year or so off a couple times, I think just because, and they weren't, and it wasn't pleasant. Like I was racking my brain being like, what am I going to do? What's the thing? What feels right after you, sometimes after you spend a year and a half doing a film, you 
don't want to do the same thing immediately afterwards and you you um don't necessarily want to spend a year doing the next thing only to have maybe the same outcome yeah you know so oftentimes i'm thinking in terms of uh the business aspect of it like and and the types of stories i want to tell i want to tell something uh longer format um something you can sell really it's, i want to sell the work usually nice so are you your strategy is to make it first in a way that you find is exciting and enjoyable and then find somebody to buy it afterwards versus yeah. pitch it all up front, wait for somebody to send, give you the money and then start making it. Uh, no, always just make it. Always just find a way to make it. Always. <laughs> yeah, why not? The, the outcome, you're, if the outcome is just to make it, then just start with making it, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so what changed with you in 2020? I mean, I know, but like what changed with you in 2021 where you could pursue stop motion specifically a little bit more full time? Yeah, well, it actually happened in 2020, hmm. uh, where I got I got the I got an email from my my friend Evan Durushti, who we all know very well. And uh, he, for those that don't know him, he's a uh, he's a pillar in the animation community, specifically the stop motion community in Toronto. He's a patron saint. He's like helped so many people. The patron saint of Toronto stop motion. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I can't say enough good things about Evan and Phil Edels too. Um, you know, a friend and colleague of his and and ours, uh, two super awesome guys that um, have their company stop motion department. I know you've had other people on the show talking about those guys and about yeah. their company and everything. They're just really awesome. And they they really have championed uh, the art of stop motion in Toronto. And um, I um, became a member of the Toronto Animated Image Society years and years and years ago, uh, otherwise known as Teus. And I met Evan there um just kind of when i first joined up um just kind of wide-eyed having no idea what it was and what was going on it was a screening and um there was a little barbecue before and i was just kind of being a keener and going and talking to everyone just seeing what's up and yeah i met evan he was a, a great guy and then uh um just kind of stayed in touch with him over the years if i had a question about a pitch i was doing because i i still do do pitches and grants and stuff like that um uh, and I would go and I would visit, he would be doing a film. I'd go and visit his set and kind of take a look at things and see how he's doing things. And, um, yeah, we always stayed in touch. And then last, uh, well, in, uh, whenever it was probably September of 2020, I think he contacted me and very nonchalantly asked if I was like free and what I was doing. And obviously like, we're still in the pandemic, but that was like, really, that was really thick pandemic times. Yeah. And um, he asked me if I was available to work on a stupid buddy project, which was insane because <laughs> I had applied to stupid buddy years and years and years ago, um, having kind of a, a much lesser reel and just kind of like, you know, no, not a, not a penny to my name to move to California or anything like that. Right. Just uh, to see if they'd hire you, you know, you're like, <laughs> roll the dice. Right. I mean, if they hired me, then I'm sure my, my parents or someone or you would have you know, figured it out yeah yeah i'd go rob a bank or something and and <laughs> and get there somehow get out of the country quick <laughs> right yeah exactly um but yeah there was a show ultra city smiths that um they were to be filming uh the the timeline of when they were going to be filming shifted a bit because i think it was a new studio they were building and i think that there was a lot of uh you know the kind of front end of getting a studio set up other than my little setup here, I can't imagine. And now, and especially after working there, like the scale of that place is insane. Oh, yeah. So understandably, so it took a little while to get in the doors and actually start working on the thing. But yeah, that was, I, I very luckily and serendipitously got hired on like the best stop motion production, I think has ever been in Toronto, probably. Totally. I feel like, well, you know, I was there too, but I feel like it was just a blessing yeah. for like anybody interested in stop motion in like Canada period. Um, so how have things changed since, uh, well, you were there for six months ish, I guess. About that. Yeah. yeah. How have things changed since, uh, productions wrapped up? Like, you know, it's been August, September, October. it's been like four months now, you know, yeah, it's been a moment. Um, I mean, I took a hearty break where I just kind of, cause it was, it was, it was quite a production, as you know, like, I don't know how you were feeling by the end of it, but it was like, yeah, it's like, I need, a, I need a vacation. <laughs> I need to sit down for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I just kind of regrouped and obviously like the fires were stoked and they weren't going anywhere after that. So it was really time to say, okay, cool. Like as much fun as it is to work for someone else and especially like um, such a great company like that, um, you know, if, if you uh, aspire to make your own work, uh, you know, then, then you're really lit up and you really want to go. So then I just kind of went back to the drawing board. I had some old feature films that I had written that I started to look into like an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted to make a really tight, like 79 minute feature film. And so that's so, what you're doing now. Just barely a feature. Film. No, that's not what I'm doing now. I, uh, now I'm, I'm working on, I'm developing a web series and building all these characters and everything to pop populate. Tell me more about this web series. Actually, before you do, tell me about spin dish, which you were creating during the pandemic. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, um, I, previous to getting all this great animation work, I was just always serving. I was just working as a server because, you know, the old trope it, uh, as an artist, it allowed me to have enough free time that I could develop my own work and, you know, serving in Toronto, I worked at a, a busy pub downtown and, um, so tips were good and there was just, they were always busy. Um, and that allowed me to kind of support myself in order to do the stuff. And when the pandemic came and closed down all the restaurants and everything, you know, obviously like uh, they're, they're, that, that was gone, that was out the window. Um, but then as restaurants started to open up again and I chose, I chose not to go back to the restaurant for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, nothing, nothing bad, but it sounds like it's loaded, but like, just, just because I, 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 I don't have to explain yourself. I can't, I don't want too many, I don't want too many gaps for people to read into too much, I guess, oh, no. <laughs> but I well, mainly, you know what? I made the leap where I said, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to work as an animator. Yeah. So come hell or high water, that's what I'm going to do. And, um, as restaurants started to open back up again, um, I thought I had the idea that I could, uh, find a niche uh, which was doing advertising for medium to small businesses that may not necessarily have the budget to hire a higher end company to do, um, you know, animated advertising for them. Yeah. And stop motion is really, you know, my, my main bread and butter in terms of what I know how to do. So I tried to combine the two. So literally was going to people's restaurants and animating like their nacho chips, like flying around the plate and stuff like that. And then, you know, putting it up on Instagram and it was working. It started, it started to take off. Wait. Okay. So like you show up with a camera, some duct tape, laptop, a camera, a a little tackle box with some putty and clay and stuff like that. And And you're uh, like, whip, whip me up a dish. Yep. And uh, give me an hour. Yeah. And I'll do something interesting in stop motion. Yeah, I would I would approach all these places before, of course. I'd just kick in their door and say, like, all right, <laughs> hi. <laughs> all right, this is going on now. Bring me the chef. Yeah. I would consult with them and we'd talk about kind of what their what their signature dishes were. And I the, yeah, and the company was called Spin Dish. So, you know, I was like, bring your dishes to life kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. how many did you end up doing? I did like five or six. Wow. Yeah. And and that's because it took a while to develop it. It took a while for me to find the right price point that wouldn't scare people away because, but it would also kind of be worth doing. Um, yeah. Because you can't it, be like 25 bucks because that's like your Uber there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and also too, like restaurants were, were just coming back. So yeah, people, yeah, yeah. So I had to find something, a balance. So is this something that you think, are you going to pick up again? Or is it more of like a pet project? I think because it, it sounds it sounds really interesting to me to try to tap into the small to mid sized yeah business period who doesn't have a huge budget but wants to have interesting advertising and yeah. since you are somebody who you know you have all the skills you have all the you know you know all the different softwares and your you know your overhead isn't crazy you just bring in a camera and a cup uh, like your toolbox you don't have to bring in all this professional equipment you can keep prices small. Yeah, it's I feel like the business model is just about uh, trying to reach as many restaurants as possible at that point and just going and executing. Yeah, 
I mean, it has, it has. I mean, if you don't pick this up, this is what I'm doing the rest of the year now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. I mean, we'll we'll show up at the same restaurant and be like, Oh (laughs) yeah. Dueling nacho spin. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, it has merit. Like I, I, I like it. Um, my shifting brain is on the web series right now. Kind of, you know, uh, totally. totally. Cause I found, cause that was the thing. Like I always want to, um, I'm just always want to tell my little stories, I guess. And it's, it would be hard to do both unless I grew it and then was able right. to kind of oversee it and contract out animators to go and yeah. do it. You know? Like you, like you'll be like, Hey, Terry, I got 10 restaurants on the list for you today. Yeah. Here you go. See you later. Give me 12%. <laughs> exactly. Right. In a perfect world. Maybe one day. So tell me about this web series. Like, you know, you're producing it out of your warehouse slash yeah. home. Yeah slash kitchen and bathroom with holes in the ceiling <laughs> i hope those holes are patched they fixed it they fixed it yeah that we had to write a very uh strongly worded email slash text slash call in the spring because it was raining a lot and it started it was like raining yeah what the heck hi yeah, i'd like to ha- not have a hole in my roof for when it rains it like bad. what the heck guys? i mean you know me terry i drilled I, you remember i drilled through my yeah my- you also for those listening who don't know Bill just comes to the where did you come to like the park hangout or whatever with had a little lunch yeah a lunch with uh his finger he had drilled completely through the fat part of his what do you call this the fat part of your finger whatever that is whatever right under the bone there was a hole all the way through and he's just like hey guys I just did this you know I I don't even need to put a band-aid on I'm just going to air it out like I'd be like uh get me to the hospital yeah. <laughs> that's just because I'm holes here. in your ceiling holes in your hands all right so but tell me you know what kind of setup do you need to produce you're producing this like web series uh thing out of your apartment or apartment warehouse which I think is really cool what kind of setup do you even need for that I've got the, I've got the space it dominates a big part of what is my kitchen. Um, uh, I uh, There's a, a friend from the show who I'm working with and he's gonna help develop the set. Okay. I, have a, I have kind of a, um, a practice set that I built <clears throat> um, kind of during lockdown uh, that I thought was gonna be the set. And then I worked on Ultra City and the production value on that show was just so insane that I couldn't look at that. I didn't oh, no. admit- You go home and you're like, no. you're like, sorry, I've cheated on you since and I require something better now. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want really well homemade to be the standard anymore, you know? So, and I, I went back and I, oh, I brought, I brought one of the puppets over here. Oh, right? show me, oh my gosh. Oh my What's goodness, it? what the heck? This alligator he's not painted yet or anything what is he made out of uh so he so kind of the head uh always starts with cork i always started doing things with cork wait cork, cork as in like the cork wood uh yeah like cork at, literally out of a bottle well a wine bottle you just took a wine bottle and made that yeah well that's the foundation then i run wire through it what? uh then i uh with some help with some friends discovered um a really nice slow drying epoxy Mm. like a putty epoxy you mix the two parts and then kind of over the course of three hours it becomes oh wow you don't have to bake it yeah oh yeah i I know about what you're talking about now yeah yeah. Uh, axiom i think it's called great material life-changing material um and then um liquid latex build up um and then you know the eyes aren't in there yet but there'll be uh replacement beads that i can manipulate um i'll paint him and yeah wire you know, wire body with, uh, with foam and like a specific type of wire that is like special or just like you go to the, like for me, I just go to the dollar store and I'm like, this'll do. I think it's 12 gauge wire. I usually go to like above ground or any, any art. Oh, okay. Store okay. And they'll have it. Um, or for those at, for those listening at home, um, I would advise, I sorry to support Amazon, but you can get it for like really cheap on Amazon. Yeah, it's just how it is these days. Um, and then I'm no seamstress. I don't I don't make clothes or anything. Um, so I just ordered Barbie clothes off of eBay. Oh, my goodness. That's so smart. Because I was also like super impressed by this outfit. But that's like a Ken doll outfit or something. It's like a Ken doll. I would just go on eBay and search like retro retro Barbie clothes or whatever. And then usually these usually come from China and they ship for free and they're only like a couple, a couple dollars an outfit. Um, they take a couple months to get there. Okay. So you got to really plan. Yeah. I made this guy too. There's a what? Of- what is that? Guy? 
So this is uh, his arms are up right now. But, Can you uh, describe? You know what? I'm going to describe this. It's a humanoid tulip person. Yes. With uh, instead of a head, they have a tulip, and they have arms, and attached to the arms are what looks like wings, but they're giant leaves. Yeah. And and then if it, you're not it, watching this on YouTube, Bill just uh, pushed down some of the petals to reveal a face in the middle of the tulip. <laughs> So at this point, no one has people have no idea what the hell this web, web series could be about. It's got but, an alligator and a and a anthropomorphic tulip. It's got an alien. It's got an elk lady. It's got a elk gorilla. Lady. It's got all these people. What did it's, you make those tulips out of? That there's like there's wire in them, but like that, is that uh, silicone or like? Yeah, well, that's just going to Dollarama and buying the cheap flowers they have there, and then that's just, a Dollarama flower. And then painting the flower with the latex. Oh, so it brings out the color a little more and then I can paint it onto the wire so I can manipulate it a bit more. Um, oh, I'm interesting. Trying. Painting latex. Yeah. There's so much I need to learn still. What the heck? Wow. Well, I feel like, I mean, my style is just I go to Dollarama and just like whatever's here I'm using because I'm not spending any more money than whatever I can find here. Latex. That sounds <laughs> toxic to me. I'm not going to touch that stuff. Oh, yeah let's do that <laughs> i mean and i'm the guy that drills holes in his finger so yeah you're like toxic thing isn't as much of a concern maybe i shouldn't take my stop motion and material <laughs> yeah, advice from you. <laughs> we're funny though not to divert too too much from the web series thing but um we're funny because we're we're opposites in a sense that you like working really small oh yeah i'm like the tinier that like my smallest puppet that i ever made was uh like i don't even know something to reference like smaller than the tip of my pinky finger like literally like this big and so i cute. animated him jumping around and like i like he's full face arms legs i even made a little costume for him i love it head. i crazy. love it yeah. yeah and i for a time was into i had this crazy idea in my head that i was going to do everything full scale just because i hadn't seen it before and I thought that if it's full scale, then I can, then I don't have to make furniture or anything. I can just film it walking around in my apartment and stuff, yeah. which, which I like the idea of that. Still, there's an idea that I, I will do at some point and I called it uh, Mr. Timestamp and I was, uh, I pitched it to Nuit Blanche, but it, it wasn't accepted. Um, and the idea was to kind of build a full scale person and from dusk to dawn, have them sitting on like a park bench. And, you know, it's like a, it's like a business person or something. And, you know, they're, so they're opening their briefcase and they're taking out their phone they're making a call or something like that. And they're checking their watch or eating a sandwich or, you know, anything they could do. And then actual people could come and kind of sit on the bench for a second. So the illusion film it in a very, you know, high traffic area. So it's like the world's moving really fast around this kind of guy type of thing. And you're animating him. Over. I'm animating him. Okay, Nui Blanche is stupid now because that's the best idea I've ever heard eh. from going to Nui Blanche for years. Because that yeah. would be amazing, and then you could watch it later on and be like, "Whoa, there's me in one frame," and then here's the time lapse of. Uh, it would have been wow. fun to do for sure, but as I've learned in trying to go through the city to get permits, is you can you can get a permit for just about anywhere. It's just like if you can, you can just do it on your own. So you can just do yeah. You can. There's nothing stopping you. But yeah. shame on shame on Nui Blanche. <laughs> hey it wasn't meant to be also i love your idea of just animating a giant puppet and i'm pretty there was a project with um i can't remember this this artist did it with like giant robot they didn't look like humans but they were like as, as large as people he animated them in like this futuristic setting so but cool. uh i don't think i've seen anybody animate a humans a human sized human before yeah. that motion which sounds really it almost sounds easy you if if you like maybe not easy if you can create the rig to hold up with all the weight yeah yeah it might actually be easier to animate because it's just so large it's all in the build for sure it's always all in the build um can you imagine the tie downs of making this thing walk oh my god what a nightmare right like i uh i i did build a full scale person wait what you built a full scale person rig yeah he wasn't good he wasn't great like you know, you've never seen him for a reason i built this full guy and then i would just put him on my roof and like scare my neighbors and stuff like that with him but he oh, was wow. okay he was, <laughs> he was gonna be this guy and i built his uh his spine was like a giant like floor desk lamp that i found ah so it was really kind of reinforced but then when you got into the arms and everything 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I was using some couch cushion and stuff to kind of try and make it light, but it's, you gotta, I, it's so heavy. Yeah. You, I feel like you need to, you, you're probably investing like thousands of dollars in just yeah. creating a rig. It would have taken a lot more trial and error for sure to make it a thing. Interesting. But now you have my wheels, my wheels turning, my gears turning, my, my gears turning. Cause I, cause like yeah. this just instantly, this sounds like such a cool idea that it should just happen. I feel like, and like, you know, like for you of all people, like, I feel like you could make it happen. You know, you're this independent experimental quote unquote dude who like does super cool. Like even in, in your music video, you know, you have the, the hands come in and like separate through all the, all the, all the, the grass and everything, the yeah. grass and that's life size. And I was like, Whoa. And then you go to like super small other stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Speaking of the web series, like, you know, yeah. um, so your strategy is to just make it and then it exists and then you're going to try to sell it somewhere or put it yeah. somewhere. I mean, I think the idea is to um, build an audience. And, uh, and by that, I mean, I, the motivation to do this web series was born out of spending maybe a year putting together and building all the elements of a short film uh completing it and then just kind of like either recycling all the parts into the next film yada 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 and and that was great but after doing that two or three or four or five or six or seven times i was like i kind of want to just build something to last yeah and, and kind of have more of an open-ended concept where i can just let this thing evolve and see what it will become and put it on TikTok, put it on instagram um, you know, and I'm, I always question like how long certain things are going to stay in fashion. Like Instagram kind of seems like, you know, you see what's happening with Facebook, like, um, the metaverse is taking over and that's going to, well, they got to do something. Cause I'm, I never go to Facebook. Like I feel oh, like, no, most people I know don't, they, yeah. they, uh, you know, and it's, and I don't even know that it's because all of our aunts are on Facebook, you know, sharing memes and stuff. I think just things go in and out of fashion. Totally. Totally. I feel like Instagram had its day already. And now, you know, like TikTok is the thing and like, yeah. So and you, what is maybe, maybe let me reiterate, I guess you're trying to create something, uh, lasting that you can then, uh, adjust to whatever format is the most popular at the time. So like you create the sets and puppets and then you're like, I'm going to make 20 TikTok videos or yeah. a YouTube episode or yeah. like yeah. whatever, and just make it, you know, jump in and do a little story in this world. Yeah. And the idea behind it is it's uh, so it's called uh, lounge sessions at the Canary room. Okay. The Canary room is the name of the place. And this place is a, it's, it's a, bar lounge that's kind of like a fusion of like west coast california chill with like you know latin american kind of flair and festivity and uh and then just the dankness of like a potentially kind of you know divey sort of bar and populate it with just anything and everything so i'm building you know there's an alligator there's a flower the idea came to me i was just laughing thinking about a flamingo like having a drink with like uh with some guy and but having like a very earnest conversation and um as flamingos do I as mean. flamingos do right <laughs> yeah and so do a lot of it live or real audio go and get snippets of conversations and it can be political it can be about you know the news of the day it can be about anything and then have wraparound stories that are that are written so like a creature comforts Ardman fusion with right actually written scripts. That is a great. So way are you thinking of going to get a snippet from the wild and then write something around it? Yeah. So okay, let me ask you this because you decided that you wanted things to look a little bit more professional, so you hired somebody to help create sets. Yeah. Uh, does that span over into all production? Like, are you going to hire writers? Are you going to hire voice actors? Like, is this like a very professional? uh thing i think it'll i think it will um it'll grow accordingly like um i think i'd like to let it just kind of be organic and see kind of where it goes because yeah the nuts and bolts of it the base of it is it has to look good and um in terms of the writing like i'm i'm confident in my ability to write some some short snippets of of interesting stuff whatever pops into my head the real audio will support a lot of it um 
there's a stage where I'll, I will probably start courting, you know, local bands and things like that. Cute. Animate their performances, you know, like, oh, they, that sounds like everybody would want that. Who wouldn't? Sound, I thought so. You know, get stand local standard comedians to do a set. Yeah. Uh, and maybe what I'm going for is try and gear it toward being kind of like a variety show slash community type of thing. It sounds like it. Yeah. I don't it's, know. It's, it's something I want to experiment with and see what I can totally. do. Totally. I mean, I can see you, you know, starting something and just it organically turning into something else. And maybe it becomes like this Toronto, you know, piece of kind of in the moment slash history for what wild. it is. And it's like, yeah. oh, there's that band that's now like really famous animated yeah. in the Canary Room back in the day or like. Right. Uh, like that, that would be really cool. So cool. what kind of, okay, so um, business terms, I guess, what kind of investment are you looking at up front? Like you have like cameras, uh, like lighting, like is everything being produced just in your warehouse? Just I, from yeah, yeah. Um, my, my, let's say if it was a five-year plan, it would be that I would move out of here. I wouldn't live here and then would somehow be able to retain this place Yeah, and do the show out of here. Maybe then, maybe then, do some spin dish stuff out of here or fish for some commercial stuff. I guess I'm talking about kind of low key building a small independent animation company, I guess. I love this. Um, just random question. Since your warehouse living space is just one by big room. Yeah. How are you animating with the lighting? Or do you have like blackout curtains surrounded your surrounding your thing? Or are you I just like, Hey, uh, girlfriend and me are just going to live in the dark for the next eight hours as I do this. Yeah, that's usually how it goes. And I usually oh uh, I usually bide my time so that I I do it when I'm alone here. Yeah. I'll, you know, crunch out an animation in 5 hours if I can. So it sounds like to me like you have like, you know, you have this kind of like wealth of experience of doing different types of animation projects. So like you have the music videos, you have your spin dish, like you have this web series. So it like, you know, I think it'd be really cool if you just were like, had a, you know, an independent animation studio that just has all these different branches of cool stuff going on. Yeah. Obviously, you know, like that is a lot harder to accomplish because you have to think about like overhead and like hiring people and like all this stuff. Do you have, um, I guess, like a business plan to try to make that happen? Yeah, I'm like, I'm developing kind of the nuts and bolts of it. I I'm always running before I take my first step yeah. kind of thing. You know? It sounds like it. Cause okay. Another, uh, I don't know how to say this in a not nice way, but I don't mean anything I'll say it to like, that. well, okay. So like Canary room, I love the idea. It sounds really cool, but it also sounds like, uh, you know, it's an idea that may, uh, what happens if it's not a, a success, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, how do you measure success, right? Like, well, that's I, what are you saying success is? Like, it, to me, it sounds like success is for you is just be, just making something. I, I think success, uh, the, the type of success I'm, I'm looking for is uh, engagement, I guess, you know, okay. and, and repeat engagement. Hmm. So that to me, even if, even if 10 people keep tuning into it, that tells me that I'm doing something right. Cause 10, I love that. 10 people that, and I love my friends and they're so supportive and they're so great, but uh, you know, like, you know, like my friends, friends aside, <laughs> friends yeah. and family aside, yeah, like random people. internet strangers. I feel the same way. I'm like, yeah. I didn't make a success. If, if like my family and friends say it's cool. I'm like, whatever, you guys don't matter. But if a random internet stranger emails me and is like, cool, then I'm like, I've made it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Like, so, so does, yeah. that, does that mean that you are going to uh, evolve what the canary room is based on what gets engagement because i guess then it goes away from the stories you want to tell and the stories people want to hear i guess you know like if you discover yeah. that certain types of jokes do well then you might start only telling those certain you know like you evolve over time and yeah i uh no i wouldn't i wouldn't um i wouldn't cater it to like if i that sounds like bad like sitcom notes from a terrible producer you know where they're like the baby that they like they like the baby do more of the baby add a baby like, 
then it's like the VH1. <laughs> every one. sitcom but, has a baby. And then when they have a baby, you're like, this is done. <laughs> more of the baby. And then like, it's all about the baby all of a sudden. And you're like, well, I don't want it. I don't even like the baby, you know, like yeah. I, and, but you know, I, I think that it's a measured thing where you have to, you have to balance kind of, you know, instinctually what speaks to you. And then if I'm say I'm a comedian on stage, just telling like rancid jokes that no one's liking, like, and I'm, and I go through a year of that and it's just, nothing's catching on. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm misunderstood. It might just mean I'm doing the wrong thing. So uh, it's, um, I guess the answer is, um, I just have to pay attention and be honest with myself, I guess, as it goes yeah. on, you know? Well, yeah. and that's, I think that's important. And it's also hard. Like I find it hard to do sometimes. Cause like internally, I'm so driven to make that thing I want to make. And I'm so stubborn. But sometimes like I don't even I have a hard time getting feedback or like even yeah. evaluating halfway through. I'm wondering, though, like, you know, uh, say you were to um, say you're a ghost because you died. OK. And, uh, you know, you're floating through the graveyard and you stumble upon your gravestone. Ooh. Uh, what do you wish it said based on the career you're trying to make? Like, what do you what are you trying to put out of yourself into the world and what is that thing you're trying to to do and looking at your gravestone you know you've done it what does it say i mean like you want to be entertaining you want to you want to be funny <laughs> Bill Allen you know, said, funny, and, it's funny and entertaining like that, funny, that's, and in, funny and insightful maybe you know like it's funny and insightful that's nice. That sounds really nice. I could, yeah. I could be a happy ghost with that. Maybe I like see that. And then I would dematerialize and get to cross over finally. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. I don't know why I'm a ghost. I was m murdered horribly or something. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, I'm, I don't it's know. I was trying to paint a scenario where it's like, what, it, what is that thing that you are striving to uh, accomplish with your craft? I mean, I, I would like, I, I don't ever like the idea of making something that um, people feel excluded from, you know, like I'd like to make something not broad as in it's like lowest common denominator schlock, but I, I, I would certainly would like to make something that um, that people can connect with on maybe more of a universal level instead of being divisive. Like when I say the characters may be waxing politics, like I don't mean to be excluding i don't really dip my toe in the political pond too much in yeah. terms of content you know um is there I, something I, about animation specifically that you feel opens up the or like uh, gets rid of the exclusivity in oh yeah i mean one of my favorite movies of all the, of all time fritz the cat um you know classically an x-rated um adult animated film from the 70s um allowed the author to be very political Ralph Bakshi because um and and Robert Crumb but because um through the vessel of a cartoon kitty they were allowed to say all these all these big statements on society at the time in the late 60s like um so yeah I think animation can be uh you know I can be bold and say that animation is the is the highest achievement in visual arts <laughs> I can say that I mean now, I, I, I mean, agree what else well whatever <laughs> I, mean, it's a broad I feel like we're biased we're, yeah <laughs> like, we're probably biased right if uh da vinci or whatever was supposed to come on this podcast they probably have a different it would uh, <laughs> i mean i've had relatives say that my uncle saw a um he saw van gogh in person i think it was in paris and it and he said it brought him to tears and i think that's amazing and i don't discount that i'm sure but was never, it animated <laughs> it, that's what I'm saying. Like Walt Disney made people cry with Snow White, right? He said, yeah. it be um, okay. So looking at your personal stuff, you know, you have very strong stylistic choices that are going on. You've, you're like engaging in tons of different medias. And then you also have the opportunity to work like on a professional, everything is set for you. There's a very specific style studio yeah. show like Ultra City Smiths yeah. has, has working in something where the, the style and design is very defined. And I, I feel like rigid is a, a strong word, but you, you can't like, you know, you have to stay within the style guidelines. Has that changed your own personal animation now that you're exploring in, uh, this new project? I mean, um, especially 
working with Evan and Phil prior to that production, that was a bigger wake up call for me than even the production itself was the production itself. I was just trying to do a good job and not get fired the whole time, basically. Uh, with Evan and Didn't Phil. get fired today. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, I won't. I won't. I have nothing, nothing bad to say about the production. It was an amazing experience. Um, and I hope that there's more, you know. So great. if if another production came on, you'd you'd say, Yeah, I'm I'm gonna oh in a second, in a second. In a second I would second, put yeah. I would put whatever I'm doing, unless I'm making vast amounts of money doing my own thing. You're I'm... like, listen, Canary Room is, <laughs> right. is yeah. uh like yeah. you guys should be working for me now. <laughs> I mean, I might even put that on hold because it was such a great experience. Um, but when I we did a um, like a five week training boot camp thing prior to the production with Evan and Phil put it on via Stupid Buddy uh, to kind of just brush some of the animators up on on animating for television, you know, and just kind of what some of the mechanics of the dynamics of motion and everything that were were needed to execute a lot of that realistic animation they were going for because. Uh, for those that haven't seen it, um, I understand what you mean. Rigid sounds like it's a put down, but but it wasn't like a zany show where the mechanics of physics didn't apply. Like yeah. characters had to rest and like, you know, people, they were moving like real people. Yeah. And I meant and, rigid in like a stylistic choice, like, you know, oh, yeah. defined in a space and you... But yeah. exactly what you mean, like, yeah. you know, the puppets were moving very realistically. And that yeah. was a that was an issue I had because my animation style is like super rubber hose exaggerated. And like, I remember the first couple of shots I was doing it to redo them because like I was putting way too much movement in. I was yeah. doing big actions and the director was like, no, 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 no. Like, here's, I here's mean, what it's like. I had the I would have done the same thing I because I'm I'm like you. I Things are a bit more whimsical in my brain, but I I had the fear of God going into the thing because i had had this boot camp where it was like don't make because in that boot camp i was trying to make guys jump over things and pivot on a dime and their whole body goes and they and they're flying back because i have a i have a cartoon brain i think um uh so in that like the rigid the the pain the growing pains of learning how to be more disciplined with like human movement yeah. definitely i benefited from having those five weeks of like a literal boot camp that uh you know it's not like i was in the in the in the navy or anything like that or the marine corps or anything but like in terms of animation it it was like that because i was going hard every day having to fight my own instincts to make things a little more silly than they were supposed to be totally know? so yeah. do you think you know having to learn a restrained animation style is something that you're going to incorporate into your own work, even though your own work is, you said you, you liked things to be zany and lots of movement. I think with the lounge in terms of, um, in terms of selling some of the realistic dialogue, very similar to creature comfort. Like, I think that it elevates the dialogue. If, yeah, probably. Yeah. If the characters are kind of interacting more like people kind of realistic people um that said though like anything goes like if something feels right then then the style guide for this show is not nothing set in stone at this point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. as long as it's consistent enough that that you know my my core audience to be isn't tuning into a little show every week and it's radically different every week like there has you know i'll just try and maintain that consistency at least but totally. no i like that i'm wondering like thinking about you know your overall career from the last seven or eight years of when you've been stop motion animating what you know you said that you reached out to tons of people you're bidding you're looking for grants you're connecting with people and you're always making projects and so like what like it sounds like you're grinding a lot in a lot of different areas but i'm wondering what is the what is the number one thing that's contributed to your success and success defined as uh you've been able to get and continue to uh work on projects like one example would be like you know you have a refined style that people enjoy and look at and they're like i want that or another one could just be like um you know you find the right budget the right place and the right time etc like what is what is maybe a skill you've developed or something here. I'm just like blabbering about, I'm asking you a million. No, you're questions. helping me. You're, you're, you're helping me for sure. Yeah. Um, but like, what would you consider has made you successful throughout this last decade in this, in this career path? 
I think just consistency, like maybe, um, maybe, uh, you know, gratitude's obviously a thing, but that's aside from just uh, work ethic. Like I, I can pride myself on, I, I, I am good at self-imposed deadlines. Um, wow, that's good. Yeah, I'm good at that. That's one of the things <clears throat> that is I can, I set goals and I, I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself. So if I don't think I'm working enough, like that's the word, like for me, my Zen is knowing that I've worked enough. Nice. Uh, wow. Yeah. If, and I, and I have a, a, a terrible fear of, <laughs> of failure that is nipping at my heels all the time that. What, maybe what would be failure to you? Um, having, having not, uh, uh, applied myself, you know? So the, the constant drive to, uh, these self-imposed deadlines and to do your best and the fear of not having to do your best has propelled you to do your, do your best. <laughs> like, have you ever felt, have you ever looked back and said, oh man, I was misguided. I should have worked. Uh, you know, I slept in too much. I should have worked more or, you know, I just didn't try, try hard. I just like let things happen. Has that ever happened to you? Thankfully, not in my animation years. Um, yeah. In my film years, maybe that there there was a bit more complacency. I think in my film years, and I because I used to, I before I started doing animation, I really wanted to be a filmmaker. And I really wanted to make feature films, and it's not to say I don't still, but but um, I think that maybe I was sitting on my hands a little bit more when I wasn't doing animation. There's something about animation for me. I think it's probably just the joy of the practice. Like, you know, yeah, I'm hard on myself and yeah, I like, I, I push myself all the time, but um, it's it's the right kind of hard on myself. It's not like I'm showing up to a job that I, that I hate, you know, like when we were doing Ultra City, I had to pinch myself every morning. I couldn't believe that I was doing this show. I couldn't believe that uh, I felt so spoiled because like, <laughs> oh my God, like so many people, did so much work on that show to allow me to get to that moment where I got to animate the scene. Like the totally. Scene. Yeah. That's on it that. was, I felt like that too, because like, you know, working on your own productions where you're like, you're doing the design, the storyboarding, the animatic, you're yeah. making stuff, you're like every, and it takes months to just get to the point of animating. And then animating is like, it almost feels too fast. And yeah. then to just jump on a production where there's a hundred people who have done all that stuff for you. And you just walk in and be like, I'm going to move these puppets now and not worry about anything. It's, it's like a treat. Right? It's very strange. Oh my God. And like, you know, I, um, you know, we all, we all kept breaking the puppets all the time and yeah. didn't have to know, worry about that either. It's a puppet oh hospital. God. You know how it is. And then, so, and then you become, but then you become like, uh, you become conditioned and you break a puppet that normally would put your show out of production for like, you yeah. know, your short film or whatever at a production is like, cool. I guess like we're down for a while until I fix this puppet. You break, you break your puppet on the show and then you're tapping your watch being like, where are these people? It's been, yeah, come on. It's been 20 minutes. Like where's Megan dear, poor Megan <laughs> working her ass off. Cause we're all breaking the puppets and everyone's standing around being like, Oh my I know, God. I know. I know. I had to buy Erica a bunch of coffees. Cause I just felt so bad. <laughs> right? She's like, you're not the worst one, but also like, you know, they they talk about Terry on the walkie talkies, like, Oh, he's broken another like hand right? or whatever. Megan Dropped and a hand and the fingers broke off. <laughs> And Allie, I'll give a, I'll give a shout out to Allie. <laughs> yeah. Fixing um, all the mistakes. Take me back. Okay. So obviously, you know, you have tons of experience. You, you like, you know what you're doing. You've got the full setup. How did you, what did you start with? Like, you know, you're a film student and you're like, stop motion sounds cool. Yep. Tell me what you originally, how you started. Cause I, I think that's very important for people who, you know, if somebody's listening and they yep. want to get into stop motion or even just try it out from different animation, like, where do you start? Because with 2D, you need software, you need blah, 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 drawing skills. Well, I think that um, <clears throat> uh, in the case of stop motion for me, I think what kept me from getting into it earlier was my own preconceived notion of what it was. And, and it seemed like it was too big. It seemed like it was like, oh, man, I have to build everything and I have to get this. I have to figure out that my camera and my lighting and I have to buy all this stuff. And it's just, it's too much. This sounds like, this sounds like it's just going to take over like 
everything. And, and maybe I still was kind of deciding like how much I was going to commit to doing animation and stuff and exactly what changed for me and, and what I would recommend for people that maybe want to get a feel for it and, you know, build up their own confidence with the fact that, you know, and literally anyone can, can do it. People are really sweet all the time and they see a movie I did or something. They say, uh, Oh, I could never do that. And I say, of course you could do that. You just have, you just have to do it. Just start, start doing it. And for me, it's not around anymore, but I'm sure there's similar apps where I, I cut my teeth with the vine app. Do you remember Vine? Yeah, you with Vine of all yeah, things. It's yeah, it's weird. So Vine used to be that you touch the screen every time it would take rough roughly a frame, or it would it would take video. And if anyone doesn't know what what Vine is out there, it was a an app that was very popular. It was TikTok and, before TikTok. It was TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a it was seven a, seven seconds. A seven second looping video. It was like and, the video's answers to Twitter, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. And you would touch the screen and it would record for the amount of time that you were touching the screen. And I just started playing around with doing animation. And I did that for like a year, a year and a half of setting up my camera with or my phone with my really kind of like rickety phone tripod. And so all the earlier vines that I have luckily saved on my computer. Um, oh my gosh, I want to see them all. Yeah, I'll, I'll you should upload them to Instagram. I'll send you some. Yeah, oh, please. One's on my Vimeo. I did a series called Plate Faces, where I was doing different faces on plates, doing different things. And I was, and you tap, you tap the screen, and it takes a video. And and to record sound, I had to do the the audio frame by frame too. So I'm in my apartment, sounding like a crazy person, going like up, oh, eat, up, uh, oh, <laughs> like phonetically learning how to make noises and things like that. Too. Wait, so. You were taking a frame of audio to say a phrase. So if you wanted to say like animation, you'd be like, eh, mm, eh, mm, uh, like and yeah. it would sound like that. I made this one where there was a plate and he was a, uh, he was like an Italian guy and he, he was made of spaghetti and he sucked his own face up into his mouth. And I think he said like, mama mia, there he goes, mama mia. And I had to go like, ma, and I'm doing it in a character voice too. So I'd be like, <laughs> ma, so, so people can hear me. I, there was a business underneath me and i'm upstairs going like ah, ah. <laughs> and does it sound okay yeah he says mama mia it worked <laughs> i can't believe it it's worked. i have to i have to listen to this right yeah. afterwards because this sounds <laughs> crazy to me stop like stop motion music or like voice acting <laughs> yeah 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 i'm a pioneer in the field oh my goodness that's that's crazy yeah. Uh, Bill, we've talked about, you know, your career, where things started, uh, you know, what you've worked on over the years, how things have changed for you recently. What's next? You know, is there anything that you wanted to that we missed that you think is important to chat about as we're kind of wrapping up? Oh, yeah. Um, golly. Um, I don't know. You know, you, you, you get me going and I can just <laughs> I can be long winded and just go on forever. Uh, I can't believe it's been. Hey, that's a good sign. It's been been over an hour hasn't it yes <laughs> no idea welcome to the animation industry podcast yeah yeah uh, well you know um yeah you know i'm just uh, thankful that you invited me on uh oh, of course got to give some shout outs to some nice people and talked about some stuff uh i don't know like uh my advice to people would be to just just start doing it however you possibly can and I, um, I, you, you do this too. I would advise that people, um, if you can, if you have the resources or the space, try and build your own puppets too, because you, um, oh my gosh, a, yes. You form a relationship with those puppets and it's just a little more special when you're working with them. Well, um, and it's, it also just helps you evolve in your animation and understanding what needs to be moved, how to move things, yep. how to build things to move them. Like, yeah, yeah everything the puppets i was making when i was like in high school were just like i think this looks cool yeah. and then i go to animate it and it's awful and it doesn't awesome. work and now like i just have this uh you know this built-in intuition of what's what i need to like anyways 
a whole other topic. <laughs> a whole other topic. And, it, and in the grueling phase of like building your puppet and everything and the long time that that takes to, you know, you're often thinking about what they're going to do and you can come up with a lot of ideas of, Oh yeah. Totally. You not have thought of before based on, you know, just sitting there just can, you know, can you be done? Can I, can I animate this thing? You know, like, so yeah, I don't know. Just, uh, and uh, you know, just uh, don't be discouraged. Just love it. Good, good advice. Yeah. Well, Bill, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Terry. I, I appreciate it. It was great. Yeah, I'm really excited to see some Canary Room stuff when it comes out and also uh, some Mamma Mia plates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, if you're listening and you want to get in touch with or follow Bill, you can do so by checking him out on Instagram under, under Badump underscore pictures. Yes. Is that how you say it? Badump? Bad, badump? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> or you can email him at wallysan at gmail.com w-a-l-l-y-s-a-n at gmail.com and that's all for now thank you for, thank you so much for listening okay bye <laughs>